Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, Zem. It's yeah. uh, my pleasure to talk about uh, sustainability and everything for, for the short time that we have. Yeah. Um, I think it's a no-brainer, like President Al Gore opened Slush yesterday, to keep this planet livable, we need to do something uh, pretty fast. But it doesn't seem like that. It's so big a theme that it doesn't really resonate. Or yeah. what do you... What, how did you get into uh, sustainability and how did you choose your problems to kind of like... Um, my perspective was always to get people excited about the changes yeah. rather than to make them feel like it was an obligation or it was, there were negative impacts personally. Yeah. So I've always looked at it as there are two waste streams and um, cradle to cradle theory has really driven me towards making better decisions and feeling excited about it and investing in companies that um, are like-minded. Yeah, so, so you actually started quite a few of the kind of environmental mindset things as right. a first editor for, for interior magazines about sustainability or eco-ecology. So how did you take that kind of monster and put it into something that's understandable and easily? Well, bring? I think people really respond to aesthetics. I'm an aesthetic animal. I love beautiful things. I like things that make me feel good. Um, and I have always created spaces that are very kind of inviting and exciting. And I wanted to approach it in a sustainable way and to make, um, to prove that you could have sexy and sustainable in like one sentence. People thought that they could never be, yeah. they can live harmoniously. So if you do that, I think then people are inspired to do things that are good for them, but also good for the planet. How did you see the reception of that when you started? Um, it was slow <laughs> to be, <laughs> for people to uptake it. I think it was really um, a huge boon that, that some of the bigger magazines gave me full, I would have three to five pages a number of magazines and could just pick beautiful yeah. objects that people would first respond to aesthetically and then say, oh my God, these are eco-friendly, that's shocking. Because I think there was always this, this expectation that it would be very crunchy and granola and didn't feel or look like they had wanted. Yeah. So did it, like, just from a personal perspective, pushing something that's new to people and kind of maybe doesn't seem so mainstream or something like that. How did that feel, kind of pushing that rock up the hill? And when do you think it tipped that people started? It well, I like pushing people. Yeah. I find it really... <laughs> <laughs> so I, that really wasn't the problem. I think it was just um, having more and more opportunities to show people that there were alternatives out there. That was really the biggest thing. Yeah. So now one of your jobs is also, um, one of your many hats, let's say, is uh, being an advisor to obvious ventures and to startups. How do you translate sustainability and, and environmentalism into something that's measurable or interesting to, to investors? Um, well, to investors, I mean, there's a growing constituency of investors that understand consumers want products that are made with a, um, with, without chemicals that are toxic, yeah. with carbon sequestration built in, with using clean, renewable you know, energy, and that they're adopting that uh, and understanding that investors will, yeah. will gravitate towards those companies. So that's becoming easier and easier because of the demand. Yeah. Um, so before I was always on the demand side, pushing demand, and now I'm on kind of the, the other side of it, looking at companies that are actually addressing those. So, yeah. um, you know, we are measuring, we have some very, um, you know, simple measuring, measurement tools, and we use a lot of external inputs. I personally come with this lens of cradle to cradle. Yeah. So cradle to cradle being the theory that all things that come from the earth must go back to the earth, either as a biological or technological nutrient. There are only two waste streams. So I was saying to you earlier, I love here you have, you have recycling and yeah. you have biological waste and, and then you have waste waste, right? Mm. And in this linear economy, we used to look at, there was, there was a take, make, waste kind of belief system yeah. where you made One something, way. you used it and you yeah. threw it away. But now we understand there is no away. Yeah. So instead, we have to look at things in this circular economy that everything's constantly being yeah. put back into the system. Yeah, my company as well uses waste. Um, I, know, I love that. So, so there's like, um, 
you're talking about this cradle to cradle, but sometimes isn't it difficult to kind of measure between some products or who is really sustainable or, or how much, uh, who is more or who is less or how, how do you put that whole thing? You said you're a systems thinker. So yeah. how do you approach these kinds of things that have so many parameters? Yeah. Well, I think for us, cradle to cradle is the gold standard, right? So there's, yeah. there's also, there's bronze, there's, there's silver, okay, there's So it's gold. a certification. It's a yeah. certification okay. on yeah. And it's the certification that then informs the circular economy. Okay. So it is the highest standard. So if you're, if you're cradle to cradle platinum, you basically are you know, using 100% renewable energy. You're, you have no um, off-gassing, no output of negative chemicals. Okay. So that's platinum and you know, it goes down from there. But that's just, for me, that's, that's the pinnacle. Okay. Um, but there are lots of other good certifications and, and I look at all of them and I, you know, we, we launched Fashion Positive okay. with, with Cradle to Cradle so that we could look at the clothing companies that were really addressing all of these issues, yeah. including human rights, yeah. which is also very important. So what kind of products would be certified through Cradle to Cradle? So everything from home, we have Benjamin Moore certified a, a Cradle to Cradle paint. Okay. Um, that's at a very high level. Okay. Um, so no VOC volatile organic compounds are released. Okay. Um, we have lots of clothing lines. Stella McCartney. Yeah. Has a, you know a ton of products that have been certified. There's so. Caring. I mean, h how do you? So I'm just curious. This wasn't part of the discussion, but anyway, I'm gonna yeah. ask. Like, how do you how do you get all those criteria in there? It must be a lot of manual work, or have you automated that? It is. Or how do you deal with that? Like so it's not automated yet. It's still very high touch, and okay. it's not cheap. It's not incredibly expensive it's because we're a nonprofit. Yeah. We help supplement that. Yeah. Um, but you, we have a bunch of different certifiers. A number in Europe and a number in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and now we're expanding to Asia as well. And those certifying arms, you'll go to an assessor, and the assessor will look at the different, the seven points. Yeah. And in this seven-point system you know, it will be all the other things that we just talked about, so. Yeah, interesting. Do you, do you foresee that kind of a system coming for, let's say Slosh has probably like 10,000 companies or something like this yeah. represented here. When, do you see every company being kind of ranked in some way in their total impact in the future? I mean, I would love that. I think <laughs> that that would definitely push yeah. every company to at least take a closer look and be introspective. Yeah. But, you know, I don't see that in the near yeah. term. I, right, that's why we have to have things like certifiers so you differentiate and then, con then it builds consumer demand. And then you're just, I think you're missing an opportunity by yeah. not being conscious. Is it possible to turn that kind of non-toxicity or sustainability into, into a dollar sign? Like, is there some sort of, absolutely. or is it just absolutely separate and you, can't mix those two. What do you think? Well, no. So it's obvious. Our whole perspective is that you can't that combining purpose and profit makes good business sense. Yeah. So we've found that companies like you know Beyond Meat, which is really rapidly growing and grows, <laughs> no pun intended, grows meat from pea protein. Yeah. Is GMO free. Is, yeah. You know doesn't have. It um, doesn't have the environmental impacts of growing a whole animal and the transportation, but has the mouthfeel and texture and bleeds like real meat. And we think that, that companies like that are showing that, you know, it, the demand is there. Yeah, plus and plus is more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your work. Um, tell Which us one? a little bit about, um, yeah, what kind of companies uh, you've looked at or give us an example of, of one of the obvious ventures or... Okay, so Beyond Meat was one example. Another one that I love is Plant Prefab. Yeah. Plant Prefab is um, building homes that are, they were the first lead platinum um, residences. Okay. And now they're going to be launching micro homes, and, which we see as a real shift. In the United States, we've had these Mick mansions, which are not sustainable. The number one thing you could do to reduce your environmental impact really is a reduction of, um, of coolants. Mm. So um, refrigeration is actually the number one uh, um, 
flying is a flying. pretty good one as well. Yeah. Well, no, but flying is, transportation is like fourth yeah. on the list. Yeah. Right? So the biggest impact that you have is refrigeration. So if you yeah. could reduce that. And I was thinking about one thing everybody could do is you get in your car and you automatically turn on the AC. Not mm. in Finland, not today, let's mm, say. But, yeah. but in California and other places. And in the, Finland, probably in the summer. Places with sun. You don't yeah. need to do that. So, uh, <laughs> but, but going back to plant prefab, um, there's 40% of uh, materials used for a home are actually go into the waste stream, mm, yeah. which is obscene. And it, with, with plant prefab, there's n less than 4%. Wow, that's good. That's a good reduction. What about Ecofabulous? What does Ecofabulous um, so, stand for? <laughs> well, Ecofabulous came out of, I had two children um, with very severe asthma. Mm. And I set out to figure out how to cure their asthma through environmental impact reduction. So I knew that it was because of the, the VOCs in my home. I could tell, I could feel it. So I set out to do that, and I, um, and I successfully got rid of their asthma. Wow, okay. So by, by eliminating every toxin in the house. Unbelievable, but, and I also said, I'm not gonna sacrifice my aesthetics. I wanna have a really beautiful home. And I was able to do that, and I, it ended up being photographed nine times. <laughs> with, and by the way, I was not a designer, nor yeah. was I a chemist. Yeah. So it was just, I was a passionate mother. Yeah. Who said I was going to do this. But then everybody wanted to know where these products were and how to get them. And there was no way yeah. to do that. There was no repository. So I created EcoFabulous as that intersection of style and sustainability and a place to find those products. Yeah. But I did sell it three years ago to Huffington Post. And now it lives on Huffington Post. OK, that's excellent. And um, I mean, that's obviously a huge, huge personal reason. But uh, originally, where did you get the spark to or the drive to do environmentalism before it was kind of mainstream? I mean, now we have Al Gore yeah. opening slush, so it's pretty cool now, I think. I mean, honestly, I was, um, I was born on a hippie commune. Oh, and cool. so where we had to use everything, we didn't even have traditional toilets. We, so we knew yeah. We knew where everything like where it came from and where it was going to go. Californian uh, <laughs> dream I mean, here. This is this is beyond. So, um, but yeah. So I, I, that was my my personal kind of journey was to yeah. to figure out how do I live um, more consciously. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, let me take a question from the audience. Um, with regards to certifiers, there will always be ambiguity. How do you make sure everyone is on the same page? So um, the most important thing with that is really training. So the Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation in, um, Institute, we have very standardized ways to look at it. And then we train all of the assessors. And by the way, if there's anyone who would potentially like to be an assessor, we are constantly trying to train assessors so that we can grow the certification program. Yeah. But but we do have very strict criteria, and and there is, and then we also have all the protocols yeah. that are online and accessible to everybody. What about are there like kind of international standards or or protocol mm -hmm. about that? I mean, either in the U.S. or internationally. Or what do you see happening to that? There's so many. Well, well we use Okatex and GOTS yeah. as partners. Okay. And so we're looking at the standards that are already um, already kind of. Uh, approved of, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that people understand and that they that they respond to. So yeah. also like uh, USDA organic, yeah, is the only organic standard that anybody actually trusts. Yeah. So we use all of the trusted inputs and then we and then we layer onto it. Yeah. Okay. I know we have a little time, but I'll ask you. That's a good one. USDA organic as well. Sometimes it's difficult to know what the kind of supply chain has been in something, whether it's an industrial product or something that you're buying for your yeah. home. Because that organic, you know, really well-treated thing might have come twice around the globe for transportation. Absolutely. Or, and this, um, this professor yeah. from, from here actually did a study where they looked at the footprint of uh, oil, uh, food oil that they were doing. And they Palm looked oil, at transport, probably. everything everything possible. And the biggest footprint was that the bottle was kind of wrinkly, and there was oil being left in the bottle. 
so the oil was so heavy to produce in the ground and you know doing all the farming and all the all the stuff that goes yeah. to food production was so high energy intense that 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 was the biggest footprint how do consumers or or people how how do you do due diligence on these companies for example and see yeah. what their whole supply chain is cuz it's I mean, so difficult so that's a good question i think that that's why you need certifiers yeah. you need and again this is a nonprofit I am in no yeah. way <laughs> benefiting from this in any way except yeah. for as a human being on this planet. Who cares? Um, and I think you need certifiers. So there are people who, are, who have no investment in it. And that's, that's why we wanted it to be a nonprofit and took it out of Michael Baumgart and Bill McDonough created Cradle to Cradle as a philosophy and as a structure for looking at things. Yeah. And so for me, that's, that's why I helped start the Institute so that we would have Somebody, a third party that was trusted that in no way benefited from any a company. Yeah. A uh, quick last one. So, so obviously preaching to the choir, there's a crowd of technology savvy uh, people interested in you know, global development goals and so on. Right. What would be one thing you would like people to work on? Uh, how do we use these people's brains who are around us now? <laughs> uh, to the benefit of the planet. <laughs> I mean... I started, um, I started Near Future Summit yeah. with the idea that we had to look at solutions yeah. rather than, so I never look at what the problem is, I always look at what the solution is. So, and that's, I'm a, I always think I'm a trend spotter in the solution space. Okay. Right, so what are the things, where are the advancements happening yeah. most rapidly and um, most effectively? And so as, if you're a company that is, you know, trying to put better products into the world, looking at where, where, are, the, where are solutions most needed. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I always approach things. And again, companies, uh, investors are more and more um, conscious of the products that they're investing in. And you'll have smarter investors looking at you if you're addressing um, social and environmental impacts. Thank you. Two seconds left. Thank you so much, Two seconds. Sam, for that coming went so quickly. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks.